Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. In today's episode, I speak with Stephen Spencer, founder of Stephen Spencer & Associates, a collaborative consulting and training organisation. We discuss why customer experience is so important right now, how to maximise interactions to drive value, and what attractions can do to foster a more innovative culture. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's really lovely to see you again. It's an honour and a pleasure. Thanks very much, (laughs) Kelly. Well, so many people have recommended that we speak to each other, so I'm glad that we got to have a little chat yesterday. But as ever, you know this podcast, we're going to go straight into our icebreaker questions. So I would like to know, what is the worst job that you have ever had? Oh, that's easy. Um, One Easter when I was a student, I I worked for an employment agency. So it's a different job every day. And the worst job was cleaning out the undercarriage of a private jet that belonged to an Arab sheikh. So we there's a bunch of us put in a in a van we had to wear so much uh, protective clothing and visors and he- things over our heads that you literally couldn't see and then you had high pressure hoses and you you could just glimpse the luxury within the jet through the open door but we were underneath just um spraying out the oil and grease and dirt and god knows what it was a horrendous horrendous day i sort of thought my life is over before it's begun. If this is, <laughs> if this is how I'm going to spend spend my life, what am I going to do? You were so, so that close was, to the luxury. You could almost touch it. Was, it. It, it, was. <laughs> it was. You could see that, you know, it was all sort of um, very beautifully, or, ornately designed, you know, in keeping with the culture inside. Uh, but underneath it was just a regular old, filthy old bit of kit. I feel like that sums us all up, right? inside we're all just regular normal filthy old people (laughs) well you speak for yourself I was was thinking of I thought we were all looking up to the stars I thought that's you know we're all in the gutter but some of us are looking up to the stars that's the quote isn't it I'm trying to keep real trying to keep real (laughs) Stephen (laughs) okay I've gone a bit retro with this one so I'm hoping that you remember this program so do you remember a program called stars in their eyes I do excellent Okay, so let's go back. If Stars in the Rise was a thing now, who would you perform as? Oh, it, it's it's easy. Elvis. Ah. Oh. Absolutely. Elvis is my go-to for karaoke. Funny enough, I've been a massive fan of Elvis uh, since the day he died because, um, you know, he wasn't obviously relevant in 1977. But the day he died, obviously, I spent the whole day playing all his music and um, I I just got absolutely hooked and years later actually there's an attractions connection here I got to meet and work with a heroine of mine uh, the late uh, Debo Duchess of Devonshire at Chatsworth and um, I discovered that she was a massive Elvis fan and what I didn't know uh, but later read in her autobiography was that she too became a fan the day he died because she saw all the programs and heard all the music Anyway, yes, um, no, no contest. I would be Elvis. And what, what song? What, what you said that is, is he's your karaoke go to? What's your karaoke song? Funnily enough, um, it's a song that he did, I think, very well, but not originally his song. But it's my way, oh, which wow. kind of also is my, you know, personal theme tune. I love this. So I never I do this. things anybody else's way. It's always my way, but not in a you know, not in a sort of command and control way, just this is my way. And if it facilitates, you know, stuff, that's great. If you don't like it, there's lots of other people who will do it your way. Excellent. Your choice. I'm enjoying this very much. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. I would like to know what your unpopular opinion is. Well, I think my unpopular opinion is that um, line of duty is increasingly um, disappearing up its own fundament. Oh, um, gosh. Or should we say uh, that Jed Mercurio has believed his own hype? And um, 
the last series was a sort of rag bag of references to previous series, um, a, a completely flimsy plot. Um, I'm not just saying the ending was disappointing because it was, oh, spoiler alert. Oh, but no, you can't do that, Wolf. No one's li- Wait, I'm so I sorry. I left a gap. I said spoiler <laughs> alert. People could have switched off at that point. But no, um, the, the thing that got me sort of slightly suspicious of Jed Mercurio was the bodyguard. Uh, that's that one off series that he did um, where we were expected to believe that a man wearing a, an explosive vest would be allowed to walk from one end of London to the other to go and visit his wife and children uh, rather than being taken out, you know, before he could put the entire population of central London at risk. I just thought this is ridiculous. So, you know, I, I, I spent part of lockdown watching, um, you know, all the previous series of Line of Duty and uh, the early ones, absolutely brilliant. But I tell you a series that's better than Line of Duty and that's Spooks. There was never a bad episode of Spooks. I think it was nine series. We watched about something like a hundred episodes and there wasn't a single bad um, episode. And also they constantly refreshed the central characters um, and whereas we all love Ted, obviously, and um, Who doesn't? Kate and Steve, um, I mean, Ted, you know, it is inconceivable that that man would still be in that job, considering everything that he's, you know, for the best of intentions, done and, and got himself mixed up in. It's, uh, it's ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. So I'm sorry if that's an unpopular opinion. I think but, it is an unpopular but, you know, opinion. Now we can go back or nearly go back to the pub or we can go back and sit outside. We need to keep ourselves warm. There's no point everyone just sitting around saying, oh, did you see Line of Duty? Oh, it was really good, wasn't it? No, let's <laughs> let's actually be real here. <laughs> oh, God. I think this is really going to split our listeners because I, <laughs> I do know that there was a lot of people that were really unhappy about the ending. And if I'm completely honest, I was one of them. However, I have loved every single minute of Line of Duty. And I did love I did love the end, the final season, if it is the final season. We're not quite sure. I don't think it will be. Clearly, there's more. If they if they want to do another series, there's more to uncover, but maybe they shouldn't bring it back. It's um it's kind of unfortunately, it's a bit like what happened to Doctor Who, which was amazing when it was rebooted with Chris Eccleston. I'm not talking about um the, the latest incarnation of the Doctor, who, you know, I'm all for that, but it's just the fact that the writing got more and more self-indulgent. And if you're writing Doctor Who and it's unbelievable, you really should take a look at yourself, I would suggest. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> so Stephen Spencer and Associates, it's a collaborative consulting and training organisation, and you've got a simple purpose, and that is to help extract maximum value from your customer's experience of you so there we had a little chat yesterday and there was a few topics that I really want to cover today but let's start with the biggest one which is why is customer experience so important right now I think right now clearly it is really important because it has changed so much and the changes um are going to be with us for the foreseeable future. You know, we've had this dramatic, probably five years of accelerated um, uh, adoption of online and, um, you know, remote, as we're doing now, remote um, meetings and so on, um, and people shopping from home um, in, 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 in a year or less. And um, so straight away, businesses don't have that... Um, personal contact with customers that previously they could have actually um, exploited or or at least known what was going on. Um, Secondly, there's still going to be an element of of public health and uh, and social distancing. And, you know, people are going to be nervous. There are going to be, uh, there's going to be a a need for um, businesses to continue to demonstrate that um, they're providing a a safe, healthy environment for customers, which, you know, risks um, creating an experience that's compromised. And thirdly, I think um, for the foreseeable future, there's probably going to be less customers around. There may well be less uh, or fewer, I should say, staff serving them. Um, And there's probably going to be less money in the system as well. 
for many attractions, obviously the international market is going to take quite possibly two to three years, if not longer, to, to recover. Uh, that's what all the predictions say. And um, so it means we've got to do more with less. So fundamentally, how do we focus in on every customer's experience and maximise every interaction so that we get maximum value out of it, both for the customer and for the business? Maximising interactions. Mm. And I guess how we framed that was it, it's understanding what elements of the experience drives the most value. How, how do attractions do this at the moment? What are the steps that they need to go through to look at how, how they can make that happen? Well, I think um, something that um, could be done a lot better in many attractions, and I've worked in many attractions and with many attractions, is a much more joined up approach between marketing and operations, let's say, and possibly sort of finance and strategy as well. The challenge with being a customer experience consultant is a lot of what you're saying sounds like stating the bleeding obvious. But the reason you have to state it is because um, it, it passes a lot of organisations by for all sorts of reasons, good, good and, and not so good. But really, really understanding who are your customers, breaking them down into recognisable subsets. So I'm a great believer in developing customer personas and one of my favorite sort of ways to do this working with um, organizations is, you know, if this group or this couple or this individual was a celebrity or a band or a team or a character in a soap, who would they be? And you find as soon as they've identified that person, then they can really start to put layer and layer and layer of, you know, how would we treat this person? How, what would this person want from us? What kind of communication would they appreciate? You know, what would make them go, wow? And I think what often happens is the marketing focus tends to be on idealized segments and the reality on the ground is, is real people. And what really works is when marketing gets out there and, and, and sort of gets stuck in and, and you know, talks to the customers and sees who's coming in and there's a complete consistency between strategy and execution because at the end of the day you know whatever you do the most powerful thing you can do for a, a customer is is speak to them and um, treat them the way they would want to be treated and the only way you can do that is if you are able to look and listen and observe and and take that time to engage and um, again keep listening and give that customer the response they're looking for and you know you see it time and time again the most high-tech attractions you know attractions that that have incredible properties whether it's heritage properties or brand brought to life in, in amazing ways it's still the human interaction that's the most powerful thing. So understanding, which is important also to give your, your team the confidence to talk to customers in the right way, understanding who they are is, is the fundamental for me and that being consistent through the whole organisation. And how does that change? Because, I mean, we're recording this, I mean, it's, it's the 11th of May today, so what, next week, 17th, most indoor attractions will be able to open yes um so we're we're still looking at capped capacity we're still looking at um a reduction in in operational staff probably front of house staff for attractions how, how do you look to kind of monitor that now and how does that change as restrictions start to get relaxed and you get more and more and more people through the doors like how does that process change what can people do well um I think, given what I've said, that, you know, the most important thing you can do is to maximise your customers, every interaction. And, and you know, in, in um, many people know this, some people won't know this, in, in customer journey mapping, which is the, the sort of classic way to, to actually think about your customer's experience, you identify all the touch points, so all the interactions between the customer and the attraction, obviously starting with before they ever visit so advertising or the website or review sites or whatever it is and you map all those touch points then you identify what we call the moments of truth which are the 
the real make or break touch point. So, so the, the points at which you could really deliver on the value proposition or not. And um, by doing that, um, and then matching that uh, customer journey to those customer profiles, you can start to say, right, you know, and I, I think, for example, the work that people like BVA, BDRC and Decision House have been doing um, in terms of sentiment research really plays into this as well, because they've identified some uh, COVID, you know, um, personas in terms of where people are at, um, in, in terms of their willingness to go back, their nervousness or confidence about interacting again. So you build all this in. So what I'm saying is, bring your team together and say, let us uh, work through the experience that we're going to give to our visitors when they come back, when we're able to reopen. You know, I hope that attractions have already been thinking about um, how they um, add something extra, you know, really um, make visitors uh, feel not just welcome back, but that there's something extra special that's been laid on to welcome them back. Um, and again, you know, that doesn't have to be something very expensive. It doesn't have to be something high tech, but it just has to be something that is appropriate to the brand and relevant to the customer. Bearing in mind, obviously, that we're talking for most attractions for the foreseeable future, you know, it's the local slash staycation market um, rather than international. So again, you know, just a great opportunity to say to the team, everything's changed, you know, everything's new, isn't it exciting? You know, we're, we're opening up again. Maybe we've done some, you know, some work behind the scenes, a new exhibition or, um, you know, just new information that we've had the chance to research about our site that we can share. But whatever it is, let's now plan the reopening or the next stage of reopening, you know, almost as if we're planning a family Christmas or a celebration, you know, and, and think what we can do. And I think, you know, just get everybody involved and, and everybody share the excitement. You know, we know that there's challenges for teams coming back who've been maybe furloughed um, or new staff being recruited in, in, in a lot of cases as well, who you have know, never had the experience of, of working at the attraction before and now suddenly you know we're reopening it's a big deal but some of us weren't here before some of us are nervous about being back it's all a bit strange some of us have been here the whole time and we're knackered so actually that is another reason to bring people together not just for you know what I call pre-opening training which is almost like going through the motions but to make it really really special we've we've been recently working with a museum that's actually was closed already before the pandemic for a major um refurbishment and and also a rebrand and a repositioning of the museum and um we created first of all with um a workshop that we ran for all uh teams across all departments a fact-finding workshop and then translating that into pre-opening training that was much more about exactly what I've been talking about. What are we going to do? How do we take this great new shiny vision that we've got and turn it into customer interactions? Who are our customers? What do we know about them? What do we need to do? What would we do if it was our granny or our, you know, brother or our friend coming? You know, what, what would we do? And just turning it into a, a mission that is translatable to everybody's role and everybody's capabilities I love that idea that you position it as a real kind of celebratory event I think that's a really that's it's such a nice way of looking at it and and what does that mean to people like you say there'll be you know for 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 attractions you've got such a different range of people that will visit what yes. does that celebration mean to them how do you apply it to that to that individual person I think that's such a nice way of, of framing it also, I think one of the things that attractions have been really good at as they've been talking about reopening and that process of how they do that is most attractions haven't been talking about reopening and going back to normal. They've actually been embracing the idea that they don't have to go back and do the things that they used to do. They can embrace something different. And like you say, that might be 
they they might have a new attraction they might have a new yes. um collection they might have something new that they've got to celebrate but even if you don't you still can improve that kind of customer experience by shifting the way that you do things and that's kind of that's the next thing that I want to talk about is is how do attractions kind of reimagine what they've been doing and be a bit more innov- innovative moving forward from from being able to open again for just the reasons that you say I've always been slightly wary of the expression build back better because mm-hmm. superficially yeah great but actually um I think it implies that we're trying to get back to what we we're doing before but just a little bit better well you know I don't know about you, but before the pandemic and before I knew, obviously, there was going to be a pandemic, I had this feeling, I think a lot of people did, that we couldn't go on the way we were going. You know, whether it was over tourism, obviously, there was a lot of inequality and um, division in the world. We were, you know, we were literally on on course to destroy the planet. And, um, you know, it just it just felt like this isn't great and then we had that period of reflection in the first lockdown when you know if you had a garden if you had access to green space you had time on your hands it it was it was just wonderful to be able to kind of reflect on wouldn't it be great actually if you know if the birds every year were able to be born into uh you know a, a world that was that much cleaner you know or if the canals in venice bring it back to tourism ran clear all the time rather than views of Venice being dominated by these enormous ships and so I've really tried to talk about building forward better because I think it is about this process of of true innovation which is actually creating something new and different so to do that I think you have to be really really clear on you know what is your purpose what you know what is your reason for being what is your vision and organizations and consultants, you know, sort of uh, use smoke and mirrors talking about purpose and mission and vision. But, you know, when I talk about um, mission, I, I'm really referring to why why we're in business, you know, what we're trying to, to achieve, which, you know, if it's different for public sector and private sector and third sector organizations, obviously, I mean, for private sector, it, it may be about um, share price, or it may even be about selling the business in at some point in the future um obviously for museums and charities it's it's about a long-term very long-term project and then vision i say well why is that of interest to this the customer the visitor the the person that you're aiming that experience at and um so and per, within purpose is is um also uh, values and i think you know it's a great time to revisit mission, vision, values, and say, this is, this is what we believe. This is the difference that we want to make in the world. Now, how do we go about it? And, you know, an example of that, um, back in 2012, I was um, helping to launch the Emirates Airline cable car. Uh, in the run-up to um, the London Olympics and Paralympics. And, you know, it had a very complex structure because it was ultimately owned by Transport for London, TfL, and then Docklands Light Railway, DLR, and then it was operated by um, the um, cable car company, Doppelmeyer. It was um, the front of house team was Continuum, which I was working for. Okay. Um, the sponsor was Emirates. Um, <laughs> there was a security company and a cleaning company. I think there were about eight different um, stakeholders. And we had to design what the passenger experience would look like. And we created um, what we call the passenger charter, which was basically everything you need to know as a new employee. And they're all new employees. And they're all coming from uh, Newham and Greenwich, most of the uh, recruitment had already happened in Newham and Greenwich for the Olympics. So um, we were sort of hoovering up what was left in a way. And I mean that actually very positively, because what we got was a whole load of people who'd never worked in customer facing roles before. Some of them had really, you know, interesting and quite often quite harrowing backstories about how they came to even be in London. And there were 40 
ethnic backgrounds uh, across 100 initial recruits. And, and then, as I say, all these different brands. So how did you bring it all together? And we came up with uh, the very simple, uh, what we called our, our vision statement, inspiring journeys. And so everything had to be measured against inspiring journeys. So the uniforms were, they were, they looked, you know, rather than like T- um, TFL uniforms, they looked like um, airline uniforms. Right. Um, but when it came down to more mundane things like selling a ticket, issuing a refund, handling a lost property inquiry, we did not use the TFL standard procedures, which were, you know, to put it mildly bureaucratic and not very um, customer friendly because they weren't, it wasn't inspiring journeys. But when we ran, we talked earlier about pre-opening training, when we ran pre-opening training on the passenger experience and presented each of the um, new recruits with their passenger charter, they were whooping and cheering and yelling and stamping their feet at the end of these workshops. I mean, I've never had a reaction like it. I had people asking me to autograph the the charter for them because they felt it was such a, a special thing that they were doing. And within three months, and you know, bearing in mind, we opened literally, it was a such a steep learning curve. We had 30,000 passengers a day, almost from week two. Wow. Um, we were moving ropes and stanchions around. I had to move a thousand people while they were all standing in these ropes and stanchions because it wasn't working, the queuing system. And that, you know, again, that goes back to every um, every interaction and how you actually, you know, you don't just look at a load of cattle in a pen and say, oh, okay, that's, that's the guess. You think about, hmm, the way they're queuing, it's not right, it's not working. Um, and anyway, the, the end of that story is that we, we uh, came top of the TfL passenger survey for London within three months from, from a standing start, never had a cable car before. These people never worked in customer facing roles before, but they all got what we were trying to deliver. So for attractions, obviously you can't not everyone can open a cable car. But um, you can go back to what is your essence. This museum I was talking about earlier, they have reimagined, and they sort of were founded in the 19th century and, you know, had really quite a sort of set offering. And they've reimagined it for the 21st century in a way that makes it accessible to everybody. You know, it's totally um, accessible. There's no, no one who can't actually find an angle to be um, you know, to 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 be uh, to for this to be relevant to them. So, you know, I think it starts with that, and then it. I mean, we have a we've created not just for COVID, but for the long term, uh, what we call our innovation toolkit, which facilitates this process. And the middle part of the process is the fun part, really, because it's the brainstorming, it's the innovation facilitation, where we say, right you've you've clarified your purpose you've clarified your vision you've um you've also identified your assets because you've got some challenges you've got some burning issues you have to deal with you know whether it's financial or other issues that you have to deal with right now because otherwise you'll be out of business but beyond that you've identified what are your core assets now we need to think about who are the potential audiences for those assets? And of course, some of them who were there before are not there for the foreseeable future, or they've changed. So we look at trends as well as segments. Then we look at all the different business models, all the different revenue models that you could, and, and you know, it doesn't have to be purely revenue, but because we're very much about sustainability and, and recovery, I think it's important that we identify every revenue opportunity and we say all right if you take your asset where you're particularly strong you apply it to these audiences where it really resonates and you've got these potential business models that you could you know and I'm talking for attractions it could be anything from a virtual curator tour to a new family play area to you know a new you know petting zoo it could be anything virtual physical or combination of the two And then you do some uh, evaluation based on effort versus reward, you know, and 
there's a simple matrix that just allows you to prioritize, you know, your long list down to a short list. And now you can start to work up, you know, which of those ideas can we turn into reality? Some of some of them we can probably do very quickly. Some of them are medium term, others are longer term aspirations. But what should come out of that is something completely new because you didn't start with this is what we do now how can we make it a bit better you started with why do we exist and we don't exist in a vacuum so for whom does that matter and then what could we do one of the things that you talked about earlier was about getting the whole team involved you know from marketing to operations to front of house yes in that whole customer experience journey how do you do that from an in a innovation perspective so how, like what can attractions do to kind of foster a more innovative culture within their organization so that people feel that they're part of that process they can they can input to it well, I think one of the exciting things that definitely happened in the last year was that um, organizations had to become less siloed you know uh, you, you see lots and lots of organizations for all sorts of reasons some of some of it historical over very long periods of years you know, but others quite new. I mean, when we had the cable car, we found that there was a different culture on the north side to the south side. And we, the team members started saying, oh, can we work on the south side today? And when you probed and said, why? Oh, it's like being on holiday over there. It's lovely. <laughs> and part of the reason was because the management team was on the north side. So <laughs> there was a bit more scrutiny, a bit more structure. But and we were like, crikey, that, that, is, that shows how quickly culture uh, forms mm. because that was that was in within three months that happened yeah so not not being siloed is a really difficult thing but because of covid so many organizations had to think across all departments mm. literally across all of those touch points because they had to plan you know safe um uh, uh, and and also viable um uh, visitor experiences, visitor journeys. And I think it's really important to keep that going. You know, it's it's really important that um, departments all work together. I mean, the organisation, and it surprises people when I say this, that I've worked in that was the least siloed was actually the Royal Collection and very old. So I was um, lucky enough, one of the perks of age, to, to be around... Um, when Buckingham Palace first opened to the public. So I got to do the shop. And we had a, a sort of a, a single mission at that time, which was to raise £37 million to restore Windsor Castle after the fire of 1992. I realised for many of your listeners, it would be a revelation that Windsor burned in 1992 because <laughs> they probably weren't even born. But look it up in the history books. It happened. And, and it, it was really important that we raise this money because the government had tried initially to say the government would pay and uh, there'd been a public outcry. And so it was declared that uh, the royal household would raise the money itself. And so opening Buckingham Palace to the public was one of the ways that it did this. What we found, what I found was we worked in an office where it didn't matter which department you're in, curators, curatorial people, um, marketing, commercial people. I mean, we were quite a small team, but we we literally worked all cheek by jowl. So you could pop into the office of the keeper of the Queen's pictures and say, um, I, I want to crop this picture to put on a, a range of stationery. I can't quite decide which bit to crop. Now, in lots of organisations, I know the curator would tell you, you can't crop it. You can't crop it. Don't put it on. Don't put it on a range of stationery. It's not appropriate. Whereas in an organisation where you might think that would be the reaction, it was just, yeah, I'd take that bit because that's that's really fun. If you do that, look at the expression on that woman's face. That will really capture people. And, and they, loved, they loved helping. But part of the reason was because we had a single objective. We've got to raise £37 million. Everything we do has to be commensurate with who we represent. And sorry, I always get a bit... Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it was such a powerful mission that we're all on you know we yeah. so we didn't have big budgets I always remember I go was talking about the Duchess of Devonshire earlier she was one of our trustees and back before the current Queen's Gallery the old Queen's Gallery was a real kind of Heath Robinson affair and the shop 
was awful. It was a brightly lit uh, formica unit, harsh, totally unsuitable environment for um, what we were trying to do. And um, back in the day, it turned over about £400,000 a year, even however bad it was. But the Duchess kept saying, this shop is a disgrace. It absolutely is a disgrace. Something needs to be done. Well, we didn't have a big budget, but we had to do something because we had Debo on our on our case. And uh, so we got we were given 25 grand and it was about sort of 1500 square feet of shop and it needed everything doing. So it wasn't a lot of money. We managed to get an offcut of a carpet that was being woven as part of the restoration of the castle, which literally an offcut, you know, carpeted the entire space. We borrowed some antique furniture. We found a fantastic uh, designer called George Carter who can make things look amazing um, with um, with paint and and uh, and just great design and great lighting. And we we transformed the shop. And the following year, it, it um, took a million and a half, uh, one and a half million pounds. And the point was, we did not have a big budget. We had to use our ingenuity to find somebody who could do something on a very small budget relative. We had to really translate what we thought a shop that um, was attached to Buckingham Palace should look and feel like so that we could showcase products that people would want to buy because they clearly couldn't get them anywhere else. And because they felt they were almost buying literally the product from from the royal palace, and that's what you know. That's what that's what actually is important. That people are excited, people are um, emotionally stimulated. Um, you know, on that customer journey, there is. Um, a, 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 I've got a, a somebody I, I really admire called Colin Shaw, who is um, a, a bit of a guru of um, of customer experience. And he talks about the peak and the end experience being the two most important for um, the overall creation of emotion and memory. And of course, creating the right emotions, the right memories is so important because so much now is um, dependent on word of mouth and recommendation and of course, loyalty as well. So um, the peak experience, you know, it might be if you go to the Tower of London, visiting the Crown Jewels, is that a fantastic experience or is it absolutely awful because you had to queue for an hour and, you know, there was no entertainment or cover and it was raining and you were shoved through and everyone was rude to you and, you know, it just felt like it was a blur or was that experience facilitated because there was entertainment for the queue? Maybe, you know, Henry VIII's jester was wandering up and down. And when you got inside, you were allowed the time to interact with the, the exhibits. And you came out saying, wow, that was incredible. Obviously straight into the, um, into the shop. Um, and then the end experience, which of course for different attractions might mean different things. It might be the toilets, really important. Duchess of Devonshire, took us into her toilets, the gents' toilets at um, the Orangery restaurant at Chatsworth to show us the mint and hand-painted tiles and told us the toilets are the most important part of the experience. And I've never forgotten that. But it might be just whether somebody says thank you or, or you know, wishes you a safe journey or, you know, crouches down to the children's level to talk to the children to find out what they thought of the experience. You know, it, it's that that sends you off. You know, we always talk about first impressions last, but last impressions are incredibly important because, yeah, it's like when you when you um, have a lovely meal in a restaurant and uh, you, you build up a rapport with the waiter or the waitress, and at the end somebody else brings your bill, and it's like yeah. oh, um, and it's like you were you're having dinner in a friend's house, and suddenly a complete stranger came to bring you your coats, and you didn't get to say goodbye to your friends. So it, it's it's really powerful, but yet actually really quite simple. Um, if you if you really going back to what we started with, you go back to who are my customers, what do they want, um, what's that emotional journey as well as that physical journey, um, how well does it deliver 
on the brand promise, the value proposition, and and what are those those memories that we're creating and those emotions? It feels like from that story that you just shared as well that the that the the, the one thread that, that runs all the way through this from all of the things that we've covered today is about everybody in that team having one shared vision. Yes. That ev- everybody has that one shared vision. And that is the kind of core that runs through everything that you do from a customer yeah. experience. I mean, I was incredibly fortunate in, in, uh, in my career to go um, and study at the Disney Institute. Now the Disney Institute's, uh, they don't currently, but they they did run programs in the UK, and I know quite a few colleagues who've been on them. But they weren't as good because you weren't at Disney. Going to the Disney Institute is a totally immersive experience. But the point is, you know, the person in the laundry, the you know, the cleaner. You it doesn't matter who you talk to; they have the same vision, mm. and that's how it always was from you know when Walt was around they went through a wobble after Walt and then his brother Roy died and there's a really interesting book by Michael Eisner who now runs Portsmouth Football Club but you know sort of turned Disney around um, in the 90s about that but you know it is that idea that everyone has the same vision everyone knows and has the same vision of who the customers are everyone knows what we should be doing for them and you know, if you follow that up as far as possible with empowering people to do the right thing, you know, which is probably a whole other webinar or podcast, but, you know, um, that is very powerful too, because if people are on the same page, they will know what is the right thing. And, you know, it's giving people that confidence. You know, we, we recommend um, teaching people storytelling techniques and communication techniques, as well as, you um, you know, just teaching people about service standards. You know, if you if you teach people that actually this is a skill and and you know it's it's a science and it's an art. Um, and you know, as go back to my earliest days in customer experience, we used to talk about French waiters and the fact that you know they have this immense pride in being a waiter. And it, you know, it's a profession. It's not a job that you just do while you wait for something better to come along. So if you can convince the people on the front line that they genuinely are as important, I go back to this museum that I was talking about earlier, that's their new approach is that front of house and back of house work together. Back of house will regularly appear at the front line and talk to visitors. It is one team because everyone's role is equally important. And I don't know many organisations that, really really practice that a few that might preach it but you know and I'm not saying it's not difficult to do it's jolly difficult to do it's jolly difficult because if you're the leader of the organization you have other pressures on you that quite often people you know out in the organization don't know about or see but by the same token I also learned that delegation is just the greatest skill to learn because the more you delegate if you do it right the more you empower people the more you build them up the more you develop them the more you allow them to reach their full potential and then when the going gets tough people don't stand back and say right what what we're doing now boss what what's your plan everyone just instinctively gets stuck in and as we know, you know, in, in visitor attractions, when you never quite know what's going to happen from day to day, if everyone gets stuck in no matter what, it's more fun, it's definitely more productive, and it's definitely better for the customer. I think that's a very good note to end our podcast yeah, interview so. on. With... Sound bite. <laughs> I've got one more question for you before you go, but um, yes. where where can people find you if they want to find out more about what you do and what you offer where's the best place that they can find you absolutely well the website is um stephen spencer associates.com and on social media it's positive stephen and uh yeah and and on linkedin um again we, we have a company page and and i'm on there as well so yeah do 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 have a chat you know we 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 may have something specifically that we can offer to um you know our toolkit we're very excited about and we'll be rolling that out over the next two to three months. 
uh, to show how it can work in different sectors. But, you know, I, as you can tell, I just love talking about this stuff. So, you know, if, if somebody just wants to have, let's say, a discussion about um, line of duty versus spoof, <laughs> then call me. OK, well, we're, if you want to do that, listeners, we will put all of Stephen's details in the show notes. So if you've missed, if you missed the website address, don't worry, just head to the show notes and they'll all be there. We always end the podcast in asking if you have a book that you would recommend. So something that you love or something that's helped shape your career in in some way, whatever you like. Absolutely. Well, um, I'll show it to you, although the listeners won't be able to see it. it it's um, a book called The Pursuit of Wow by Tom Peters. Now, I didn't know who Tom Peters was in 1997. I was um, very lucky to go on a five star a uh, fam trip to Atlanta to find out about the merchandise mart there and, and the um, the facilities for retail buyers. But also we, we were shown the very best of Atlanta from, you know, Martin Luther King's church to um, the Jimmy Carter library to CNN, Coca-Cola. And we had breakfast with Tom Peters. Well, for those who don't know, Tom Peters wrote the first a business bestseller called In Search of Excellence in 1982, which identified what are the traits that make companies um, successful over the long term. And there's there's still the traits that we, I think, would talk about today. Tom's still going strong. He blew me away with the power of his message and his delivery. It was very much about we need to get back to, and he still talks about this today, uh, you know, people being the most important um, raison d'etre for any any organisation, the little things being the big things, so the details being the really crucial things that make or break experiences, make or break uh, business. He's passionate about women, as, as he says, women buy all the stuff, they make all the decisions, they're far better leaders than men, um, and he's been saying that for about 30 years. But The Pursuit of Wow, which was the book I went to buy um, when um, I'd heard him speak, and I, I was just like, wow, I need to know more, is literally about how you can take any experience, however small, um, whatever size your budget, whatever sector you're in, and you can turn it into a wow experience. In other words, why should anyone be excited by this? You know, how many meetings have we sat in where we've planned things that quite frankly, we're not excited about. So why should anybody else be excited about <laughs> it? So although it was written 20, 25 years ago, um, it's still my favourite book of Tom's. His brand new book, actually, which um, is just out, is called Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. So you can tell he's still talking about the same things. And this is his post-COVID. Um, he's 78 now. And uh, I, I, I've met him a couple of times. And I've interacted with him uh, sort of on on social media and I said to him I can no more believe that you're 78 than I can that Captain Kirk is 90 and I got some smiley faces um, in response but he's he's basically saying what I'm saying which is you know it comes down to customers interacting with people and everything else is the luxury that you're afforded by either the fact that you have you know, a site that um, is already set up or you have big budgets, but, you know, it'll stand or fall on that human interaction. So that's a message for everyone. Well, I very much like the sound of Tom. Oh, so, you'd, you'd love him. Honestly, he's, he's brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to go and follow him. Yes. Um, listeners, if you are interested in winning a copy of that book, as ever, if you head over to our Twitter account and you retweet this episode announcement with the words, I want Stephen's book, then you will be in with the chance of winning it. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on today. I think this was an excellent discussion and I'm I'm intrigued as to what the response will be from your unpopular opinion. <laughs> but I, I, I do hope that people take you up on your offer to have a, have a chat because I think that um, there's some really exciting concepts that you talk about there. And I think that um, they are they should be at the heart out of what attractions are looking to do now that they're reopening. So thanks Absolutely. for coming on and sharing that. It's been an absolute pleasure, Kelly. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. 
Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.